Good evening and welcome to Professor Siraj Sheikh's inaugural lecture entitled Ensuring Assuring System Security, Tackling Engineering, Monitoring and Perception. Professor Siraj Ahmed Sheikh is a Professor of System Security in the Institute of Future Transport and Cities at Coventry University. His research sits at the intersection of cybersecurity, systems engineering and comp computer science, addressing use-inspired research. His approach is less about hacking or breaking things and more about engineering and building secure systems. He's published over 100 papers, supervised eight PhDs to completion, and his research has been funded by EPSRC, Lloyd's Register Foundation, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the UK's National Cybersecurity and Ministry of Defence. Over his career, he's served as an industry fellow to Hariba Myra, funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering, EPSRC funded policy fellow to DEFRA, National Innovation Lead for Cybersecurity at the Knowledge Transfer Network. He's a Chartered Fellow of the British Computer Society. So before I hand over to Siraj, please can I request that all delegates remain on mute. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the lecture, but you're also welcome to submit any questions in the chat box throughout the talk, and we'll pick those up at the end. So Siraj, over to you. Thank you, Carl, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to see some familiar names and some new names as well. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen and see if that works. Um, there you go. Uh, so, Carl, is that clear? Your end? Yes, all good, Sarah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, there you go. Okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, attending today. Uh, it's a it's a it's a real pleasure. Um, so, I'm, I'm I'm going to try to just talk through a um, a number of different concepts that we've kind of come across, and we've uh, kind of investigated over the, the period of the last you know ten to fifteen years, and uh, just take you through um, some of the key challenges and how we've kind of come across, but also essentially a, um, a kind of a, a collection of stories really that talk about the different challenges but also what the notion of system security kind of entails in terms of our um, our approach to um, addressing it and the notion as such uh, goes beyond the, the traditional software elements which is i think something that i'm very keen to kind of emphasize so um we, we've we've increasingly now accepted the notion of cyber physical systems and these systems an, an instance of these are consumer iot systems for example but essentially these systems are um, very complex integration of kind of software control and communication units and also uh, physical uh, resources and so so typically we will find these systems in in kind of engineering industries in transport and healthcare and manufacturing are um, are examples of that but what we realize, what you're kind of recognizing here and accepting is that um, a lot of the um, constructs we use in theoretical computer science to represent um, software behavior and, and so on, um, it ha they have to be extended onto some of those complex kind of architectures and systems, including those physical components. And so there are two key things here which make these systems um, quite a challenge. One of them is that amongst these different components and kind of units that come together, whether they're software elements or hardware elements, there is data flow, and that data flow could go from sensors onto software controllers and so on, and, and vice versa. But there is also control flow, and so that control flow uh, makes it quite a challenge, which is where a certain set of components or subcomponents come together to then have control of some part of the system or the entire of the system. And then that flow, uh, in a sense, could flow uh, itself, that, that control, in a sense, could flow from one part of the system to another. So a good example of that, for example, is um, the, the semi-autonomous, autonomous kind of driving functions in vehicles where um, either there is manual handle, uh, manual control or there is handover to a certain set of sensors and, 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 and the brain that's driving it. Now, we, we can accept that notion and then obviously take on board all the complexity. The challenge of assurance uh, in, that, in that respect then uh, becomes quite interesting. So there is the whole um, 
the, the understanding of threat, which, which we will see today uh, in some detail. But then for us, particularly trying to engineer those systems and build those systems securely, uh, and, and the word securely in itself is interesting because there is the secure design element. So there are certain design principles that we want to adhere to and demonstrate. And then there's, of course, the in-life kind of resilient operation of the system, which recognizes the fact that, you know, some parts of the system may fail or may be compromised. And then how do we operate the system to, to you know, to, 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 a, to an acceptable risk? So in a sense, that assurance challenge also evolves substantially and, and, and alters from, from traditional kind of cybersecurity controls and, and verification and testing kind of challenges. And then a key part of the notion for system security, which, which I, I, I'm very keen to emphasize uh, alongside and which we'll touch on today as well, is the number of different stakeholders who are essentially stakeholders in the system and perhaps then influence that data flow and control flow kind of properties and, and, and functions that I uh, referred to, but also then, um, you know, are responsible for uh, managing those such, such systems in some uh, secure and, and, and acceptable way. So with this notion, I mean, th this is a huge area, and so we can delve into this and it'll take a, take a long time. What I'm, what I'm going to try to do today is just run through three questions that I've come across and uh, working with colleagues, we've tried to kind of tackle. One of them is um, the kind of uh, transition that we see from what I call commodity threats. So increasingly we have digital devices and we are digital beings and we are aware of the ID theft challenges and, and kind of antiviruses and viruses and malware and so on. But what does that transition look like from commodity threats, from some of the typical kind of traditional plastic threats to more advanced persistent threats? So, so we look at collusion as one example in Android uh, as a, a kind, of, kind of an ecosystem, which is quite an interesting uh, kind of a stealthy threat example to look at. And then what do we then do about kind of this, this, this challenge? So there are a number of design challenges. I mentioned secure design kind of principles and so on. But I want to focus on something that we've worked extensively at Coventry and have got to a point where we're working with colleagues in industry, which is around security monitoring. And so uh, I'll share some statistical modeling um, for early warning um, uh, kind of functionality that we've, we've been looking at. Once again, it's an interesting area which keeps evolving as well. And then finally, I want to complete the story as well by, by, by sharing some thoughts on storytelling. Um, in terms of a research, some some research work that we're doing um, uh, currently at the minute uh, using multidisciplinary methods. Um, so, as I say, a number of concepts that are related somewhat, and I'll make that transition. But just to flow through those elements, I'll, I'll keep the terminology quite accessible. But there'll be some elements which I'll refer to, and I'm very happy to take questions right at the end, or perhaps in the chat box for clarification uh, later. So. Um, so, just want to start with this um, piece around uh, threats. Um, a few years ago, colleagues of mine at City and Swansea, we, um, working with industry, we delved into a, a particular notion of uh, collusion, the, the, the threat of uh, kind of colluding uh, software agents. Now, this is quite interesting. So, we worked with McAfee Labs then. McAfee Labs, it was McAfee Labs when we bid for the project. It was Intel Security when we worked for them. And now they're back as McAfee Labs these days, as you would realize them. So, so we, we, we got to quite far uh, with McAfee Labs uh, to try to um, validate and deploy our system. So, what's interesting about this notion of collusion is uh, as it stands. Uh, so, so this is quite accessible. I, I hope so in terms of a number of people us having smartphones and you, what you would see here is a very simple um, representation of two apps that you can see on, on, on a smartphone. One is a contacts manager or a password manager. Another one is a weather app. And individually, these apps are providing their functionality and in a sense, they're harmless. So the app on the left, the contacts manager, uh, is playing with some private data on your phone, your contact details and so on, but is not communicating with the network. And the app on the right, 
um, in a sense, uh, is communicating with the network to give you the latest weather data, but it doesn't have to um, engage with the phone as such with any personal data. So as it is, this app here would satisfy typical security requirements because it's not communicating with the outside world. And as such, um, you know, it, it's harmless. And this one, as I say, is not really you know, delving into private data. Although my weather app also looks at my location from time to time, which, which I've switched it off, but, but I'm just giving you a, a, a very simple notion here. Now, what is interesting here is that as, as these apps stand, they would go through a number of antivirus filters. Well, what happens is, is when we have a combination, what would be the combination of both of these apps, then it opens up to inter-app communication. So one example of this is in an overt fashion, um, within the Android ecosystem, there is this uh, Android operating system, there is this notion of intents. And some of these intents essentially could be broadcasted. Um, and in a sense, the app that is on the left there acts as a source of some sensitive data. And the app on the right serves as a sync. So some of those elements in terms of any, any particular type of data, it could be contacts, for example, could shift over to the app, to, to the sync and be communicated out. Now, we could suppress such functions, but the one thing to mention here is that um, these, well, in the, in the Android ecosystem, uh, operating system, we also have the notion of collaboration. So every time you use your browser to click on a PDF link and it opens a PDF, that's an example of a collaboration, a healthy, a positive collusion in a sense. But equally, those two apps then, as, as I'm showing here, could use that intent function to broadcast any unauthorized data. Um, any data that, that we wouldn't typically want. Now, at the minute, the model around Android is that it's user-defined and user-controlled. So users, so every time we install an app, it uh, lets us decide what permissions we're happy with for an app and so on. But we do that on an individual basis. And so we've seen examples of this in the wild where apps which are not related there's no expected collaboration like there is with browser and the PDF, let's say. Um, and then they would resort to some uh, overt channel to communicate things. They would also potentially resort to some covert channel as well. So it, it, within the Android ecosystem, once again, there is this um, uh, functionality to provide certain functions. So it's an, an activity manager, which essentially is is, is a live screen. So every time you have a live screen, there's an activity manager that is supporting it. And that activity manager could enable two apps that are uh, on the platform to then uh, uh, allow for any API calls between them that could then share any information. And once again, so, so the notion here is individually, when these apps are in place in an app store or they're installed at the, at the time of installation, so 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 the control is with the user, or or they're kind of uh, very simplistically um, uh, uh, scanned uh, for any uh, inappropriate permissions or, or and so on. They would pass through most of those filters, but when it comes together, then there's that challenge. Now this is this becomes quite complicated when you realize that there are hundreds of thousands of apps on a Play Store, on a typical mobile phone that could be uh, typically could be 30 to 40 apps um, and then of course that kind of combination uh, doing that analysis in combination of those different types of apps is 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 then a huge kind of you know challenge in terms of the scale and combinations but also remember these apps then evolve as well so the project went on and we um, looked at a number of Play Stores and the number of results that are published, which I'm happy to point to. But the one, uh, one achievement of the, of the research as such, which is relevant for sharing today, uh, which is in the public domain, because there were some findings which had to remain uh, in commercial confidence, was um, we 
we've we found a software development kit. A software development kit essentially is a suite of kind of libraries um, and facilitating tools to allow people to write apps quickly enough. Typically used for gaming, for example, or for writing certain certain kinds of you know uh, tools and so on. Um, and so this SDK uh, essentially allowed for overprivileging of a number of apps. And as soon as those colluding apps, any two of those colluding apps were on the same platform and they, they had access to the same set of libraries, um, they looked for whoever had the most permissions and, and was allowed for, allowed through the user control for more permissions and then started colluding with certain behaviors. So we could detect certain behaviors, but, um, but what was interesting is the widespread nature of this. So this was in the wild, uh, uh, you know, uh, available uh, for, for use, uh, the widespread kind of use of it. So this was affecting around 21 mobile apps um, with around 5,000 installation packages. So this is quite remarkable in terms of, I'm, I'm just trying to give you an idea, it's quite remarkable in terms of the kind of genius it takes to figure out how we um, overcome some of the traditional security controls and then we, um, we kind of, um, you know, use notions of collusion and so on. So moving on from this, in terms of understanding the threat space, and, and there's a lot more, of course, here, um, we want to think about what do we, um, how do we overcome this, uh, this problem and a number of kind of similar stealthy threat problems and so on. So the one thing that typically um, has been the tradition in, in classical cybersecurity has been the notion of um, attribution. And so um, the notion essentially uh, boils down to this very um, kind of, you know, uh, age old wisdom around detecting who is the source of any such activity. And in the examples that I've given you previously just now and, and for collusion, once again, we want to be able to look at which apps are colluding. Now that's fine, uh, except that a lot of the attacks increasingly that we see are multi-stage attacks. And so we want to think about, uh, and, and if you broaden the, the scope here, not just to a mobile phone platform, but also to think about um, uh, critical infrastructure and, 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 and wider enterprise IT networks and so on, um, to think about the fact that these attacks are multi-stage, but also multi-jurisdictional. So for us to be able to detect and trace back, essentially, we need to cross several regions, uh, several, several governance points and several uh, capability points as well, because certain networks along the way may not be as capable for uh, robust attribution, for example. So this is, this is quite a challenge. And this is, this is the one thing I think we realized early on, especially with stealthy threats as well, that it becomes very difficult for us to be able to um, for us to be able to overcome. The other challenge that we see, and this is, uh, I mean, the reference I give here is recognizing the challenge in uh, large scale uh, enterprise IT kind of networks, but also the internet. But this is increasingly relevant for industrial control kind of networks as well, which is around the non-productive traffic, the, all the mess that we need to get through to be able to look at some key evidence. So for example, there's a lot of scanning activity which is quite interesting, which is quite, quite a challenge to overcome. So if you were to go out to Google and search for a website which doesn't exist, Google will give you a cached version of the website. Now, Google does this by using a crawler function. So all crawlers do essentially are they're scanning networks all the time just to keep a cached version saved up for any later uh, kind of searches. Now, when you, when you put in a security monitor, an intrusion detection system, that increasingly, um, very quickly, raises alarms around who's searching my network. So in a sense, that, that just gives an example of how we kind of manage that. The one thing to add here, Google crawlers and other crawlers are also very, uh, very much welcomed by a lot of websites who are conscious of their ratings and their visibility. Because if you go offline, surely you want to be found using a Google search in a cached kind of uh, manner and so on. And there's also the backscatter traffic as well, which is around all the response traffic that we get from different devices as a result of 
malicious or misconfigured activity. And there are, there are all kinds of misconfigured hosts. So anytime, every time you, for example, load up an FTP client, a file transfer client, and put in a, a misconfigured kind of, well, misconfigure the IP in it, it keeps trying to, tries to connect to it. But for a security administrator, it's a quite a headache because they would think someone's trying to look for some unknown, unexisting um, service to connect to. And once again, all of that traffic is just non-productive and certainly defunct by a lot of the time, many of the times when it gets to kind of, you know, uh, um, um, security monitors and sensors. So in a sense, we set out a few years ago to look for um, uh, more smart uh, monitoring techniques, particularly looking at kind of early warning techniques to think about how we raise alerts on not just um, actual, uh, you know, in a sense, well-defined sources of activity, but looking at sus suspicious activity. As I said, collusion is a remarkable example of a suspicious activity because th there is a very gray area between collusion and collaboration potentially. And then we also want to think about how we, rather than focusing on the source of the activity, how we shift that towards potential targets. So that was another key, key kind of driving uh, kind of factor for us. And then of course, we wanted to look at different data sources as well, because the data source, uh, the data that uh, the traffic that you see on an enterprise class IT network is very different to an automotive controller to a robotic system in, uh, in, in, in a factory, for example. So what we did essentially is we started looking at some statistical modeling to um, look at how we estimate suspicious behavior. We took a, a very uh, basic Bayesian kind of you know, inference approach and we started looking at rather than looking at, at attacks or nodes in any, in any general network, um, which are the source of activity, we wanted to look at, look at nodes that are potentially under, um, uh, you know, under, under any potential attack or, or subject of any, or target of any suspicious activity. And so I'm not gonna uh, dive uh, deeply into the maths, but, but really this is a, a, a Bayesian kind of an inference system is well established to allow us to reason around conditional probabilities. And then what we did, is we said, okay, well, if we have a very generic system to be able to estimate and have, have a, a, a kind of a reasonable guess, uh, um, um, a probability against, against a certain estimation of, of a node being under attack, we want to then be able to take nodes of, uh, of similar uh, class, either similar nodes with different interfaces or different types of nodes with similar interface, uh, with, with different, uh, similar nodes with, with different uh, kind of interfaces and so on. So in a sense, what we wanted to do is we wanted to have layers and they could be overlapping of peer, uh, peer groups where we could then detect um, in a normalized way deviation uh, from behavior. So, as a result of any any um, any action any event, we would update that estimate uh, that, that estimation, and then we would ultimately use a, a form of z-scoring and, and grips tests to then look for deviations in a certain peer group. So the advantage with this kind of very um, atomic uh, updating system uh, is that we could have we could afford uh, computationally feasible uh, multiple um, kind of peer groups, as I say, they could be overlapping. So, a, so a node could represent a certain uh, be be mem a member of a certain peer. It could also be a member of certain other type of peer, um, uh, a certain other type of group. And so it, that allowed allowed us for computationally uh, computational feasibility. And we did a number of um, simulations to just kind of validate some of that. And, and the one thing we realized very quickly was that, um, if, if I could come back to this in a minute, uh, one thing we realized very quickly also was that um, the nodes individual behaviors, so every device, every software agent entity on a platform, and perhaps the kind of communication that it uh, executes on an interface, and it could have multiple interfaces, we acknowledge that, um, they may have their own pattern in terms of how they are how how faithful they are to their historical behavior. So we looked at non-seasonal forecasting methods to be able to then um, predict 
or est essentially estimate how a node, uh, what interval kind of a node would behave uh, within um, with respect to their own um, historical behavior. So we combined that element alongside the peer uh, group. So it allows us, allowed us for that vertical analysis in a node's history uh, alongside a horizontal analysis as well. And that kind of worked very well in terms of the ultimate, the, 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 the final um, kind of implement uh, deployments. But in terms of the results, what we found, so we, we simulated a number of classical, but also stealthy uh, kind of, you know, attack activity. And what we found was that in many cases, almost all cases, the targets, which are represented by V, uh, the victims as such, um, pretty much their deviation was picked up more clearly and very often early on from any deviations that we could do on the source of the attack. So, so, so the nodes that were the source of the activity. And this was quite welcome because we, we could then see that you know, if we focus on early warnings on potential targets and move away from attribution in terms of our resource deployment, our monitoring resource deployment, then that could be uh, really interesting. So as a, so I'll come back to um, the indicators in a minute, but as a, as a value proposition, and very quickly this moved on to commercial value proposition. As a value proposition, what we were trying to do was to say that we have a certain window where uh, any sus suspicious activity starts. And then it gets to a point where we can then detect patterns. So, so we have signatures of known activity. But the difficulty with that window is that there's a lot of uncertainty. We need to do some estimation. The, the, the classical kind of signature-based uh, detection doesn't work. And so we can, you know, there is this notion of a number of other kind of um, uh, anomalous uh, anomaly detection systems. Uh, which are uh, which are which are very good in terms of um, learning, but uh, very difficult to scale as such. Whereas we were focused very much on um, indicators that could drive that Bayesian uh, estimation. So those indicators could be a number of atomic indicators that are kind of reflections of the design of the system or our computed uh, kind of uh, averages or, or intervals that we want to pre-configure for the system or our behavioral qualities. So a behavioral indicator in a sense would uh, focus around performance to say a certain node would behave or uh, raise a certain flag uh, no more than five times in a certain interval. If it does that more than that, then we, you know, then it crosses that threshold um, uh, for us to detect. So. So we, we said, we, said we, we could definitely beat a lot of the typical anomaly detection systems around machine learning and AI, but, but focus pretty much on a very basic kind of an estimation system. Admittedly, it needed that um, prior uh, kind of, you know, uh, estimation on a number of those activities, but as a starting point, it, it was very promising. Um, and then of course, we also wanted to beat the signature matching um, Kind of capability because it's too late and of course that signature needs to get there uh, and signatures for things like collusion for example is one example but there are other activities uh, are not there uh, necessarily and are continuously need needing to be updated so so cyberal i'll talk about cyberal in a minute was our commercial proposition from this research where uh, we wanted to then be able to uh, raise warnings in that phase there where the intrusion activity activity potentially starts. And that notion of early warning sat very well. We, we had validation within the lab, but then also we went off to industry to do some prototypes, prototype deployments, and to then uh, essentially push out this notion that we want to essentially have a proactive monitoring system and a risk-driven monitoring system. The, the notion of risk sits very well in engineering communities because that's how typically they have addressed safety and, and kind of design. But also uh, the notion of risk sits very well here because remember that we are focused on potential targets of attacks rather than sources. So just to... Um, just to comment on um, CyberAL, uh, we, we 
the, the core paper that presented the approach and validated it uh, was shortlisted for the Lloyd Science of Risk Prize and there's a US patent that's been granted. It's recently been granted, but it took us four years or longer um, in terms of the negotiation. But also then um, in terms of financing and profiles, so we've raised some money and we've been part of some of the uh, um, very good accelerators, not just in the UK, but also in Singapore. Um, and so the value proposition for us has been, as I said, risk-based monitoring. So there's an element of increasing efficiency, but also then effective kind of business decisions uh, in cyber defense. Um, and, and, and because we had the advantage that we were agnostic in terms of the data domain, we could try out a different number of uh, sectors where there are particular challenges in terms of the kind of kinds of data that the diversity of components that they had on systems would generate. Um, we could, you know, we could delve into some of those kind of difficult sectors. So we have a very large footprint in maritime, but increasingly in energy and industrial control systems as well. And so we have presence in Greece and in Singapore alongside UK. It's it's still early days for CyberAL, but it's an, it's an exciting kind of a proposition out to industry for some of the research that we've done here. So, um, so happy to answer more questions on that. Um, Okay, and finally, just wanting to move on to um, the kind of the last of the three stories <laughs> that I want to talk about. Um, and as you can, as you can perhaps gather, um, the the world of security has moved and has, has come into our lives in a number of ways, and the terminology and the perception that uh, has been raised around security is quite fascinating. Um, I, I, I've been I've been within the research kind of community for the last 20 years, and um, uh, at a time when security was confined to a very few group of mathematicians, and all we were focused on were proofs and so on. And now it's taken a di very different approach in terms of methodology and, and, and engineering of security. And so I'm very mindful of the perception that it, that this area of science, which is very close to my heart. Uh, the, the perception that it carries on to people. And that perception, of course, affects not just kind of ordinary people like us, you know, uh, trying to manage our digital lives and, um, and and get a feel of, you know, how we kind of interact with the wider world, but also uh, decision-making, you know, for the corporate sector and for the policy sector. And so we've started doing, doing some work um, in this space. But just want to allude to this. This word cloud is not entirely purposeless. This word cloud represents the two national cybersecurity strategies that the UK has. And UK is one of the few countries that's, that's got a second cybersecurity strategy. It started very early on in 2011. So we are in our second five-year national strategy. And it represents, the, 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 well, the, the, the size of the words in word clouds would represent the frequency of the words used and so on. But if you look at, the, if you look at some of the words around vulnerabilities, crime, threat, weaknesses, uh, security. Um, a lot of these words don't really inspire confidence. Uh, as someone said to me, if I put these words in a loan application or a mortgage application, that wouldn't go through for sure. So I think there is a, a real problem as to how we approach this. Now, we need to acknowledge the fact that there is criminal activity and the word criminal is there as well, at least once or twice. Um, that kind of drives this. But I want our research and our science, and this is the message certainly we've had at Coventry, to be able to build uh, secure systems and to have the right kind of perception for kind of effective decision making. And so I'm, I'm inspired by this quote, which talks about the power of stories and uh, our ability to adopt the right narrative as to how we um, present these problems. So the, the kind of threats that I've talked about and the kind of um, uh, value propositions that, that I like us to push out. And so how do we capture those imaginations? So in a sense, increasingly in the last four or five years, it's becoming important that this risk, this risk around, well, this, this cyber risk, the perception around cyber risk is, is, a, is a big challenge for the leadership and the boards in the private sector. And they are under increasing pressure to be able to demonstrate that preparedness 
uh, and we know about preparedness certainly in the current crisis where we you know we, we need to think about how are we prepared for future crises but also to think about that organizational resilience uh, to such attacks, how that's a competitive advantage for organizations. Now, when I talk about these things, that's not the message that comes across from the word cloud that we've seen or the national security strategies, for example, necessarily. So I've been on a mission in a sense to address this uh, in the last few years. And just want to address this. So NCSC, the National Cyber Security kind of Center, the key stakeholder in the UK as a technical authority, um, are very mindful of this. So a couple of years ago, they started, um, they started try to break the different number of uh, the different types of attacks down into uh, into categories. And this was very useful because it at least allowed us to approach the subject in an organized way to understand the diff you know the different levels of severity as such and so uh, a colleague of mine uh, at UCL uh, professor madeline carr and myself we um, we were we we were very uh, fortunate to get some money from epsrc and to work with ncsc directly to set out uh, a a kind of an agenda for evidence based cybersecurity kind of policy making and we used uh, the art of storytelling which is quite interesting for scenarios and these are scenarios that allow us to then uh, assess for uh, decision kind of capacity. And so our, our, our kind of our studies uh, use those scenarios to talk about how the targets may, may change for those targets of cyber attacks could be individuals to, to CNI, how the sophistication of those attacks could, could change, um, and then how the urgency of response also needs to change. And, and we had then uh, these scenarios looking at automotive security. So um, you would guess why, because that's an area of close interest to us here in Coventry. Um, and we had, we had a very um, simple scenario around theft of entry, uh, keyless vehicles to telematics kind of hacking all the way to terrorist attacks, kind of ramming attacks, uh, targeting the parliament. Now we ran the study we ran a one of the one of the scenario based studies we ran this with the colleagues in the law enforcement in, in a part of the government who were responsible um, for assessing uh, the risk we used the ncse attack categories that i talked about um, earlier um, right here so so to give an example a category six attack would be a localized incident whereas a category one would be the a, the tier one kind of attack you know uh, demanding corporate attention and potentially a terrorist attack. And what we found was quite interesting. So the scenarios were all the same. There were three, there were three groups. And for the first scenario, we had wildly different assessments. So this was around uh, the theft of keyless, uh, uh, keyless entry uh, kind of vehicles. And as you would see, a group arrived at uh, attack category six for the same scenario as the other group arrived at five and three. Um, now, if you, I'll go back to the graph, but if you go back to the categories, uh, a category six attack focuses on an individual or uh, some indication of activity around a, uh, around a SME, whereas a category three is a serious an attack with a serious impact on large organization or even potentially local government um, and and well and also raising risk to central government as well um, and that's quite it was quite interesting and in a sense alarming to see that because these were teams who were set out to be doing this task for us uh, operationally you know for different agencies and then when we moved on and escalated the scenario we still didn't get con consensus so we had two groups there uh, well, we had to uh, we had basically had two different attack categorizations there between three and four and that still that still means that there's a substantial difference between the level of coordination and the level of urgency that the groups see um, you know, uh, needing for the same scenario. And we saw, um, uh, we saw convergence ultimately on the very last scenario. And which is quite remarkable because we had discussion, I remember vividly around that because there were differences of opinion, even 
even on the final scenario. But the one thing that allowed them to converge, all of them, on the same scenario, was the loss of life. So the loss of life means they essentially treat this as a tier one kind of incident, a category one incident. Um, and in a sense, what we were, uh, what what we arrived at at the conclusion in in the closed meetings and in, in, in this for the study that we had was that that was in a sense too late because we want people to be able to converge and have consensus very early on to in a sense avoid escalation and then the prevention of kind of loss of life is 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 you know of course an objective for us as well but that's unfortunate that we we use that but well we don't use that but that's perhaps you know a a, a kind of a a uniting uh, converging force uh, for the three groups so this is quite interesting because it raises and kind of confirms our 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 concerns around that you know the risk is quite complex and how we narrate well i mean the, the narration is one example one tool here um, but how we kind of perceive those risks and how we treat those scenarios, appreciating the number of interconnected um, kind of areas there is, is very important. And so we are continuing this journey in a sense where, uh, uh, in fact, my colleague at, at UCL and, and a few others now have joined in. We've kind of followed on um, from the initial work that we did with policymakers and using the same methodology to now work more closely with corporate boards and corporate kind of private sector leadership. And this is essentially looking at their readiness and, and the Coventry's uh, kind of area work is essentially once again, looking at, um, looking at complex sectors like maritime, uh, given that we are funded by laws register partly, uh, to then looking at how we use that, uh, that narrative kind of driven scenario based exercise um, as a, a method to then assess that capacity and then to reflect on how we kind of um, uh, how we kind of improve that decision making. So it, it's it's quite interesting to see how uh, we we as as a, as a research team and myself we've had to then think about very complex behaviors uh, on platform, uh, but also then being able to step out of the platform and to then address uh, perception. I just want to end really in a few minutes and just want to share with you, uh, Carl mentioned the, the, our research institute uh, where we work together um, and our security group there has a, a very um, uh, sharp mission to focus on cyber physical systems, particularly in the automotive and transport industries. But we, we are looking at some other sectors which are kind of aligned as well, which pose similar problems uh, and challenges for us. And then, you know, we, we are certainly looking at emerging threats. Uh, the emerging threat piece, the stealthy threat piece, remains a sharp focus for myself beyond just the commodity threats. Um, we are very, very much spending, uh, in fact, most of our time is spent on uh, looking at the modeling tools and uh, tools and solutions and so on for kind of automotive uh, resilience. And of course, um, the risk assessment piece, uh, primarily driven by standards, I think is, is also taking a lot of our time um, alongside the kind of risk perception work that we're doing as well. And then of course, we, we, we also work with uh, some of our strategic partners, um, Hariba Meyer is one of them, but there are others as well, where we are building test beds and, and kind of, you know, uh, focused on kind of supply chains across, not just the automotive industry, but also electronics and IT. Um, and so, yeah, so um, I'm grateful to the team who uh, are there. Some, some recent faces, some, some faces have been there uh, for a much longer time and, and, a, and, a, and a body of students. It's always a pleasure to work with colleagues uh, to solve those common challenges. And so I pretty much end here. If uh, I could then hand over to Carl, I guess. Is it over to you, Carl? Uh, I don't think the video is coming. There we go. Hello. Right, thank you very much, Sarah. That was fascinating. It's, uh, if not a little bit worrying, I have to say, I'm really pleased that there's people like you and your colleagues working on uh, 
engineering secure systems and trying to keep us safe. I think uh, so many things like the smartphone that we just take for granted in our day-to-day -day lives and they've become embedded in, uh, in everything we do. But um, the whole idea of app collusion, I found that really interesting because I can see the example you used about the weather app, look, knowing where we are, is, uh, is something that's really useful in that giving us the functionality that we just take for granted and expect. But the idea of malicious collusion as well, when we, we use our phones for banking and we've got a password manager on there, um, I'm just I'm just interested to know from you, Siraj, how worried should we be, and would we even know whether we've been the victim of a malicious collusion? So uh, I think uh, it's it's a it's, a, it's a very good question. In fact, Carl, um, uh, the the assumption that we can detect attacks. So if you go back to um, the bit about monitoring, uh, that was quite interesting because there were a lot of assumptions around detection of attacks, and we had a lot of discussion and kind of uh, you know, exploration of that. And so one reason for shifting from attribution to more target centric monitoring was, was precisely that we wanted to understand whether our key assets are subject to some suspicious activity. So I use the word suspicion rather than uh, detection or, or, or attacks because some of it could be just misconfigured kind of activity. Um, so it's difficult. It is a challenge. But then I, I mentioned the word uh, risk acceptance and Carl, you're an engineer and I'm sure there's a lot of engineers. I think we, we fly, we fly, we drive, we take risks all the time. And so there are, those are acceptable risks and there's always a, a kind of a trade-off. And that's the approach we take in terms of the engineering kind of, you know, side of security, um, you know, security systems. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's very risk sensitive. I should say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Right, okay. Well, um, we've, um, we, we've heard um, Siraj's uh, lecture now, so um, we'd like to um, give everyone the opportunity to ask some questions now. So please um, feel free to raise your hand in the chat and um, we'll um, take questions. So um, I think uh, Rachel's going to uh, facilitate the questions now. Okay, I've got a question here from Kevin in the chat which says, can you match NSCS levels with ASIL levels in CAV? And are there lessons to be learned? So, uh, so that's, a very, uh, that's a very interesting question, of course. Um, so the NCSC attack categorizations um, are pretty much defined by the impact that those attacks have. Um, and uh, the severity levels in uh, elements like uh, 3061 or 21434 and so on, um, some of those, well, there are different categories there, perhaps uh, financial risks or perhaps um, safety risks um, or, uh, uh, or information privacy risks and so on. Um, the NCAC levels would perhaps be much more um, representing uh, a much more of a cumulative uh, kind of an assessment. Um, but it is interesting to see how perhaps we align them. Um, now, the scenarios we use, uh, Kevin, um, are automotive cybersecurity scenarios, exactly. Um, so it could be interesting in itself to see whether we could um, do those assessments and so on. I think, I think, um, a lot depends on how the safety cases in the operational design domain for um, uh, for for the security standards for the automotive industry how they kind of evolve and how much they take into account any uh, any matching and mapping to more broader uh, levels. But that's certainly an interesting question, uh, one which one which um, requires more more thought for sure. Thank you for raising that. I think we've got one more come in the chat. Um, Rashid has asked, how do you see the role of SOCs in generating early warning alerts and how successful these alerts are in determining the severity of the attacks? So could you repeat that, uh, Rachel? Was it SSCs, did you say? Apologies, it's um, SOCs. Uh... I wonder... Rashid, are you there? Do you maybe want to come off mute and ask your question? 
if if you mean security operation if you mean uh security operation centers uh then yes so so they are uh, points of aggregation uh and those points of aggregation are uh important and welcome because that's where a lot of the uh, kind of uh domain agnostic capability of our um uh, of of our of our monitoring approach, you know, uh, could be leveraged uh, for for that purpose. Um, but whether whether SOCs necessarily follow that, it's difficult to know. I, I mean, it's difficult to say. From my experience, for sure, they're much more reactive, and they're much more focused on compliance. Whereas we are much more proactive. And we are looking at that phase around um, uh, intrusion estimation, which is which is what I was saying to Carl earlier about suspicion. Um, and so uh, I, I think it will take some time for the culture to shift towards widespread proactive uh, monitoring. There are certain commercial propositions and products and services out there that do that, but by and large, the security industry, particularly in the monitoring sector, is pretty much compliance driven and reactive um, to uh, uh, to elements. Okay, so I've got uh, two questions here as well uh, on the chat. I can see who's the first one, Rachel. Could you? Uh... Um, got one from Stephen um, on building on Carl's question um, about how worried we should be and your comment about security always being a trade off of risk. What can the general public um, do to inform themselves, and how do we trust that industry is making the right trade-offs? Yeah. So, Stephen, that's a very good question. Um, uh, having having some understanding of the value proposition, the commercial proposition within the industry, uh, I, I realize that the key thing there is profit maximization. And so very often um, that mean, well, that doesn't necessarily lead to good security. Now, who defines good security? That's a moving kind of space. And I think whether it's a public good of some kind or whether, you know, we need a very hardened kind of regulatory approach to it and whether we need a very hard regulatory approach to it. I I'm in the favor of maybe having a balance as such because, um, and I think that's the best way of kind of addressing those trade-offs, risk trade-offs. Uh, and I, I think the key principle for us to achieve the optimal risk trade-off is as much transparency as possible uh, with as much governance assigned to people who are best placed to address that risk. And that is not always the case, for example. So, um, I mean, one, one very simple example of this is that, you know, uh, if there is a fraudulent transaction on a website, um, on, on, a, on a credible website, you know, the question is, who is to take responsibility there? Because I would, one could argue, you know, it's the website which is best placed uh, and, and the backend systems to have to deploy effective controls. Equally, um, uh, you know, whether, well, uh, whether whether that is the case right now, I don't I don't I don't think so. So, so I think we need to open up the private sector and allow them to allow the industry to in a, be innovative and so on, uh, and put out the commercial propositions. But there, there needs to be an element of regulation, with due regard for kind of public safety and kind of public uh, you know security is a public good. Um, one last thing, oh, sorry. So I think, um, how do we trust the industry? Well, exactly, I think the regulation piece, um, I think would be key. Um, there's another question, I think from Asmat, is that right? So is there a need to? There's one from Asmat who, um, um, on the subject it. of automated security, is there a need to redesign the system security from scratch if we need to make CAVs more secure? And if yes, how do you propose we do that? Um, yes. It's end-to-end -end encryption as per today's standards, not enough. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Yes, apologies, I was interrupting. So okay. I think, uh, let me answer backwards. So the example that I gave around um, collusion 
could be one example where encryption, the end-to-end -end encryption piece, it's just one means to one end. Uh, it, it wouldn't resolve that issue necessarily. And so here's the second part of that answer and, and addressing the first question, the first part of your question, which is that I, I talked about data flow and control flow. And these are, this is a challenge in a sense, because we have um, the kind of data flowing from different parts of the system to each other and so on, but we also have the control uh, flowing as well. And so some of the control elements may still remain encrypted, um, but perhaps, you know, still be vulnerable. So uh, there are protocols um, that have been shown to, to be fully kind of, you know, uh, exchanging encrypted messages, but they're open to replay attacks in terms of uh, inserting timestamps, false timestamps, and so on. So, so I think, uh, yeah, going back to the first part of your question, I, I think because we've got data flow and control flow, uh, we need to think about, certainly, we need to think about how our assurance kind of manages that and addresses that. Um, and that will have to that will have to change. Uh, given uh, there are a few key things here, one is uh, a lot of these systems and, and CAVs are one example is where we have over there updating now, so the configuration of the system potentially could change, you know, in life, and that's a, that's a challenge. Uh, so the design is not static at the time of rollout. The second is there is hyper connectivity. So there is kind of post hoc hyper connectivity. And one example of that is the, the um, after the market uh, OBD devices that we get, which allow us to communicate with Bluetooth with our phone. So it's very difficult to then um, risk assess for a kind of post design in life connectivity modules that come around and also uh, autonomy. So if we are to buy into this future I'm not skeptical, but of course it's it's still um, it's still relatively new. If we are to buy into um, uh, this future of autonomous systems, but also kind of learning systems, and learning to the point where they have adaptive architectures and so on, then then it, it becomes quite a challenge because you know, everything is changing. Those control flow and data flow patterns completely evolve, completely change. And so perhaps we need a, a kind of a, a supervision, a hypervisor or supervisor kind of function, which increasingly we see, um, you know, as an example, as a, as a security control to then, you know, address that. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a complex question. If you deserve a complex answer, I'm afraid. So there you go. Um, We've got another question coming, Siraj, from, um, Andy, who says, with regards to estimation of suspicious behavior, if an app is maliciously colluding right from install, then surely it would appear as normal behavior and go undetected. Yeah, so, so that's a very good question. So at the, at the minute, the model is that um, we have uh, user-defined access control. So the first thing is uh, we need to educate the user so, so that may not be the case. So you, you could download a perf perfectly credible looking app, but as a smart user, if you don't want your weather app to access your location, for example, or, or perhaps, you know, uh, be more constrained in, in some way, uh, then, then we will be better off. And so we won't get into that problem. The second problem there is that we then, we then need to allow for more fine grained control for users. There is a difficult, there's a usability difficulty with that, which is that the more fine-grained um, elements you provide uh, to the user, the more lethargic they are. Now, every time you download an app, who wants to go through 56 options to, to understand you know, what permissions they have and so on. So we have that kind of usability challenge as well. And finally, um, so, so this is where active monitoring and active threat intelligence helps. So we could have, and you could, and any of us could have apps on our phones. And remember, these could these apps could be on Android Auto on your on your on your on your vehicle. You know, potentially interfacing with control messages on your vehicle, um, and they could evolve. So they could be updated in life and and evolve and, and such. And there could be more apps that are downloaded, which completely sh you know change the the kind of threat environment. Um, the question then is, 
um, surely we need to be able to have an, an active way of monitoring and managing the threats there. So that's why that's why a lot of the uh, active antivirus scanners and kind of malware detectors, you know, need that updating for definitions, for signatures, and so on. And so it's a constant battle for sure between between the defenders and the and and the attackers. So I think uh, that's a challenge. I have a question here, Rachel, from uh, Cronus around. Uh, spin out companies. Yes, yeah, so Cronus is asking, um, can you elaborate a bit more on the challenges that you have faced or are facing in taking the research into a spin out company? And can you tell us more about Cyber Owl? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Cronus, for the question. So I, I think taking uh, the set of algorithms that we started with uh, as a PhD project and then as a number of publications onto a value proposition as I touched on, uh, yes, it, there's a remarkable challenge, a remarkable learning curve uh, for me, but also for the team, because we set out on a certain mission in terms of delivering what I call good security, however the good is. But then of course, as I say, you know, we are facing those compliance kind of challenges and those preconceptions. I mentioned, uh, board members, you know, feeling the need and having the need for better education. So I think the biggest challenge I've had is to sell security. And this is the answer to your question, really. The biggest challenge I've had is to convince people that the return on investing in security, you know, is a, it, it, there is a positive and healthy return. Uh, very often, it's, it's either a compliance uh, need or, um, or essentially a cost with very little to show. So, you know, very simple kind of question to that is how do we show the number of attacks that we prevent? It's very difficult to show that. If I were to show a number of uh, attacks that have happened, I can demonstrate the, you know, the potential risk and cost to us. But then if I deploy a, a sensor and a control, how do I then demonstrate its, its effectiveness? And so, um, in the, that I think is the biggest challenge, selling cybersecurity as a value proposition, uh, offering a healthy return is the biggest challenge. And that's why going back to my answer to Stephen very early on, is that exactly, we need, we need a creative, we need a kind of innovative and, and healthy industry, but we need regulation to be able to kind of regulate what good security means and, and how that needs to be managed for different sectors. Thank you. Any other questions? I can't see any other questions. I think that was the last one that we had. Perfect. I'm just going to check no one's got their hand raised. Um, but I think you've answered them all. I think there's a, the, yeah, there's a question from Stephen, but I'm, I'm, I can take it offline if that's okay. Um, and I, I've mentioned about, you know, usability issues as well. But thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Carl. And thank you, everyone.